transfusion medicine, reduce morbidity, improve, improve efficiency, and really in some respects understand how we can always do better. And, and it's been a phenomenal service to our patients and to the mission of the Cancer Center. And, and Ed today is going to talk about GVHD and uh, blood pathogens and, and the work he's done. So Ed, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Charlie. It's a pleasure to uh, to be here, and um, if I can get this working right. Oh, I have to screen share, right? I yes. Share. There it is. Okay, that looks like it's. Uh, it works. Work. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today on uh, prevention of uh, transfusion-associated GVHD and um, the role of uh, blood irradiation and pathogen uh, reduction. Um, if I can get the slides to move, there you go. Um, for conflict of interest, I do, um, I am running three clinical trials on uh, platelets and two on red cells uh, for the Sears Corporation, but I get no personal honoraria. All the money goes to the university and uh, uh, to support my salary for that effort. Uh, not for me personally. So I'm going to review the pathophysiology of transfusion-associated GBHD, review the rationale for using pathogen reduction, address the types of pathogen reduction, um, provide data on the toxicology study, uh, talk a little bit about the clinical studies, and then compare the uh, pathogen reduction versus gamma radiation for preventing TAGVHD. So Yale New Haven's got about 1,600 beds. We have about, we transfuse about 11,000 people a year. Uh, we transfuse about 54,000 products a year, broken down as you see below, red cells, platelets, plasma. Um, graph versus transfusion associated GVHD, therefore is potential with many of these transfusions. And uh, fortunately we don't see it for a variety of reasons we will talk about. Um, TA GVHD occurs less than one per million transfusions. It's pretty rare. Clinical signs begin about eight to 10 days after a transfusion with uh, somewhere between three and 30 days, usually as a rash, associated with fever, enterocolitis, watery diarrhea, and elevated LFTs. A key sign is pancytopenia, uh, with a higher risk being in men. Um, the reason for the aplasia is that in regular graft-versus-host disease, if you will, the word regular, post bone marrow transplant, the bone marrow is that of the um, of the host of the recipient? I'm sorry, that of, of the donor. So the donor's bone marrow is um, basically replaced that of the uh, of the recipient, and the donor's T cells therefore do not attack it because it's the donor's own cells. In transfusion-associated GVHD, the host uh, or the recipient's bone marrow is there, so that the donor cells attack the bone marrow as well as the liver and the skin so that the aplasia is due to GVHD involving the bone marrow of the recipient, and it is almost always fatal. And that's why it's, uh, that kind of fatality is not seen uh, with respect the bone marrow in um, graft versus host after a bone marrow transplant. The rash begins on the trunk and spreads to the extremities. It's diagnosed with usually a biopsy and death occurs one to three weeks after the symptoms. The mechanism is that transfused lymphocytes from an immunocompetent donor, uh, recognize the host HLA as being foreign and form a response, and then the host counterattacks with its own uh, lymphocytes. However, in cases of TAGVHD, there is no counterattack, if you will, and you just get in continued growth and engraftment, if you will, of the donor T cells, which um, cause the, uh, the graft versus host uh, problems, the lack of neutralization. Uh, and what does this do to? Well, um, it's due when the recipient, uh, several times, either if the recipient is immunocompetent uh, and you have an immunocompetent donor from a, from a blood transfusion, what happens is, let's say the donor is homozygous for HLA-2 or HLA-B44. The recipient does not see the uh, donor cells as being uh, foreign because the recipient has A2 and in this case B44. Whereas the donor cells are immunocompetent, it does see the, the host as being foreign, and it reacts against the host, giving the graft 
versus host disease as opposed to like a rejection of a heart or, or a kidney would be uh, host versus graft. So it's either uh, can occur also in immunocompromised hosts due to congenital or acquired um, uh, disease or uh, medications can do this as we'll see in, in, in a short while. So the whole concept here is that the host is incapable of eliminating the uh, immunocompetent T cells and they engraft and they attack the bone marrow and that causes the, the TA associated graft versus host. So the requirements are to need to have a difference in donor recipient HLA, immunocompetent competent donor cells need to be transfused and the host must be incapable of rejecting the immunocompetent cells due to either disease or medication or congenital uh, uh, disease. Uh, risk factors, the degree of recipient cellular immunodeficiency plays a role. The number of viable T cells in the transfused product, the minimum number is not known. Uh, it's known some products like granulocytes are associated with GVHD more than other products. Um, also, the, uh, the genetic diversity of the population is important. There was a fair amount of graft versus host disease, TA GVHD, in Japan, uh, and the thought was that it was more of a, a closed uh, population because of the fact that it was an isolated island, uh, and therefore the genetic diversity was not as great as would be in a, in a larger population. Also, fresher cellular blood products like red cells stored less than a couple of weeks have a higher risk of GVHD, also for reasons that I'm not uh, familiar with, uh, and I'm not sure if they're known. The differential diagnosis, once you start seeing things as a rash, you wonder about drug reaction or viral illness. So a skin biopsy is done. When it's done, it shows superficial perivascular infiltrates. Here's grade one, two, three, and then four in the lower right. You see um, bully formation, and you can see bully formation starting here with these white circles. And then you loss of reedy ridges, which are these intrusions into the dermis. Here's the epidermis on top. And then here's the dermis, the uh, reedy ridges where the blood vessels go uh, are uh, lost and the dermis and the epidermis separate. Here you can see this set of little circles. They have a whole, this whole line shows a separation of the dermis to the epidermis, a complete sloughing of the tissue. Uh, and that of course leads to infection and, and causes problems as well. So that is what um, the TAGVHD looks like on skin biopsy. This is a bone marrow showing a hypoplastic marrow, uh, as you can see. Um, this is a patient's back showing uh, the rash. Here's the rash on the extremities and uh, this other one on the lower right you've already seen. So the treatment, uh, there really is no treatment. It's a uniformly fatal condition pretty much because of the marrow aplasia. Um, and in aloe transplants, um, you know, when you give someone a unit of blood, uh, this, this uh, can cause problems because the, again, the transplanted bone marrow is that of the uh, of the marrow donor or not of necessarily the transfusion donor, which are usually not the same. Immunosuppression is rarely helpful. Um, the um, radiation or whatever you're using to, to eliminate the T cells in, this, in the donor products uh, does not apply to FFP, cryoprecipitate derivatives, and also uh, frozen red cells, interestingly, because they're washed multiple times. Um, but it's not been reported with non-cellular products or with frozen cells, as far as I know. Uh, it's, you would need to irradiate the, uh, or in our case, pathogen reduce the product if it comes from a blood relative, if it's a directed donation, which was more common in the AIDS era than it is now, because people were donating for family members in the hope of preventing them from getting HIV at the time from uh, unknown members of the uh, blood supply. Um, and that led to other problems as well. Uh, because of the uh, TAGVHD, if it wasn't irradiated. Uh, and if uh, the blood component is HLA matched, it should be also treated as well. Leucoreduction reduction is not protective. You're not removing enough white cells. There's still four to five logs left after uh, leucoreduction. reduction. Standard blood washing doesn't remove it. You either need to gamma irradiate it with 2,500 centigrade or X radiation. The federal government wants to get rid of gamma radiation because of the potential to form dirty bombs. Um, and we'll talk about that in a couple seconds. Uh, and then pathogen reduction, as you will see, is also protective. And if you give a pathogen reduced product, you do not, we do not irradiate the product uh, at all. So this is what a blood irradiator looks like. The blood, red cells and or platelets, whatever, is put in this canister. 
the canister and it's here where the red is, is is rotating in a circle and then that whole thing rotates around to where the source of the uh, um, cesium source is here there are two pencils as i said this the gray material is lead the person is standing over here watching the red cells swivel around like a lazy susan it's exposed for four five six minutes depending on the strength of the radiation source that lasts years and years and years and then when the time is up it automatically comes back to the opening and then it's removed so that's what the gamma cell is the concern is that that um, terrorists will uh, break in um, and uh, rip open several tons of lead and take out the, the pencil source can be done but um, um, the government would like to get rid of this and move to x-ray devices and if with gamma rate with pathogen reduction you won't need any kind of a device at all actually so the indications for radiated components who are uh, those that are uh, immunosuppressed, uh, the intrauterine transfusions, low birth weight, uh, exchange transfusions and newborns, you should irradiate the red cells for that. Uh, patients with DeGeorge syndrome where there's a T-cell immunodeficiency. Hodgkin's lymphoma patients need to have irradiated blood products for, the, for life, uh, not even after they've been cured, but uh, for life. Uh, allo or auto transplants, not irradiating the transplant, of course, just any red cells that they get outside of the transplant. Um, if they're HLA max single donor platelets or from relatives, or if someone has, has uh, got various illnesses and they're getting a purine analog like fludarabine, cladribine, bendamustine, and other drugs as they come along, patients getting Campath, uh, anti CD52, anti thymocyte globulin, granulocytes. If those products are used to treat illnesses, they should get irradiated blood products. Not necessarily for aplastic anemia, MDS, Hodgkin's lymphoma, uh, I'm sorry, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's, acute leukemias, solid organs, unless they're being treated with one of these purine analogs or other types of therapies. So AA, aplastic anemia, getting ATG therapy would be a candidate, AAA would. If you don't know what it is, I'm not going to give you a laundry list, call the blood bank and ask the blood bank what their policy is. Uh, right now, what happens if someone requests it? We provide irradiated blood and then we review the indication and see if it needs to continue or not. So please call the blood bank for specific information on your patient. Interestingly, when they've reviewed the use of these products, they found that not all institutions follow the same criteria. Here are three institutions from Canada um, and uh, one from Boston. Uh, and as you can see, not everybody irradiates uh, for the same thing. Term infants, MGH does not. Um, places in Canada don't do it for acute leukemias or chronic leukemias or stem cell donors during harvest. Um, children with solid tumors, it varies. And it's an amazing amount of variability. Again, at Yale, give us a call and we'll be happy to talk about your patient if, there's, if it's a new patient and you have questions. So now that we know about T TA, GVHD, what is the pathogen reduction? What is that about? Well, that is a technology that attempts to eliminate pathogens contained in units of blood. Uh, the only thing in, and what it does, it does it by binding DNA or RNA, single or double stranded, whether it's viral or bacterial, uh, and it prevents it from replicating. There's nothing in blood that should have DNA except a pathogen. Well, it shouldn't be in there, but there's nothing in blood that has DNA or RNA except a pathogen. There is, I know there's mitochondrial DNA, but that's not um, what we're discussing in platelets here. And there's a little RNA left in red cells uh, for the reticulocyte, but we're not discussing that. We're talking about pathogens, and that's where uh, the material is attacked. Uh, emerging pathogens, as uh, I just showed you, is a concern. If COVID-19 was bloodborne uh, and was transmissible by blood, things would be even worse, if you can imagine, than they are now. And maybe COVID-29, if it comes along, hopefully not may be bloodborne and we need to have pathogen reduction technology in place to mitigate that. So the uh, therapies are two, one for platelets and plasma and one for red cells with the uh, serous technology. The uh, active agent is called S59. It's, it's a sorolin called amatocillin. It's added to the platelets at the time of collection uh, by the blood uh, center. And the amatocillin goes through the cell membrane and binds to the DNA or RNA double or single stranded, and then it, it's exposed to UVA light in an illuminator, and it cross-links preventing replication. That's how it inactivates pathogens. S303 
it has to be used for red cells because hemoglobin A will absorb the UVA and it will not provide an appropriate and effective uh, mitigation uh, technology. So this material, which is uh, a, uh, an alkylating agent, uh, goes into the blood, um, into the red cells, and it intercalates quickly and cross-links without any, um, you, any illumination at all. And then it degrades very rapidly into a non-reactive material S300. So, and this has been approved by the FDA since 2014, the, the platelets are plasma, and the uh, red cell one is in phase three clinical trials, which is what we're doing here at Yale, and I'll talk about that. So what types of um, pathogens does it inactivate? Both the red cell and the platelet forms, those two agents, uh, S59 and S303, inactivate the envelope with viruses that we do blood tests for, um, lots of other envelope viruses, chikungunya, dengue, influenza A, um, gram, all the gram negatives, most of the gram, almost all the gram negatives and positives, spirochetes, protozoa, and leukocytes. And this is where pathogen reduction eliminates the need for gamma radiation because it inactivates leukocytes by binding to the DNA of the T cells of the donor T cells and therefore does the same thing as radiation would. In fact, it does it, as you'll see, much more efficiently. There are some non-enveloped viruses that it also um, has, uh, can, can affect it as it doesn't affect parvovirus very well. Doesn't affect spores, hepatitis A or hepatitis E, which are, are not lipid enveloped, uh, but don't cause uh, chronic problems generally in patients. So it is quite robust and all the other technologies to remove, uh, bacteria don't have any effect on removing viruses, which is why I felt that pathogen reduction was the way to go rather than using other bacterial technologies to prevent bacterial contamination that did nothing for viruses and certainly didn't do anything for leukocytes either. There are other technologies we don't have time to talk about. Riboflavin, which is also a photosensitizing agent, intercalates into nucleic acids as well, and UVB light is used rather than UVA, and that promotes oxygen radicals. UVC is another technology that's used in Europe, Mako Pharma. There is no photoactive uh, uh, photosensitizing agent. The UVC itself acts to induce purine, pyrimidine dimers. And that was uh, discussed by uh, Jaco and uh, Delaney in uh, Transfusion recently. This is a manuscript that we wrote for New England Journal of several years ago, but still uh, accurate, uh, I hope. <laughs> the um, sorolin works by forming DNA and RNA adducts and cross-linking. The riboflavin I mentioned causes direct DNA and RNA damage and guanine modification. And the UVC causes uh, thymidine dimer formation. Uh, that's for the platelets. Similarly, and there are other types of pathogen reducing agents we don't have time to discuss, but it's in this manuscript. If you give uh, sorolin uh, to people, this was a study by Cirrus, uh, 0.4 micrograms per kg, you wind up with 1,100 picograms, and after about six hours or so, uh, it's down to about 100 to 200 picograms per mil. So it gets uh, quite, uh, it gets uh, reduced uh, quite uh, uh, rapidly. Um, and studies on HPLC show as far as toxicology. This is uh, before uh, UVA. This is the uh, uh, HPLC. Um, you see after UVA, the photo products have formed over here. This is a standard. And these photo products are removed by a filtration technique that is used uh, called compound, uh, compound adsorptive device, which is really colas tyramine that adsorbs the photo products. So the amount of, of the uh, S59 that goes into a recipient is minimal. It's in the micro, in the picogram quantities. Uh, the same thing with plasma. Here's plasma after UVA with multiple photoproducts. And here the photoproducts are pretty much gone after compound absorptive uh, device uh, absorption. We've been using this product, the platelet one at Yale since 2017. We started, we were among the first and we've been the leaders nationally for this product. This is the average, uh, this, these are in uh, units of platelets. This is per year, the average per year. Green is all the platelets, red is pathogen reduced, and blue is the uh, platelets that are not pathogen reduced. And as you can see, there's been a steady decline. This is average for fiscal year 17, 18, and 19. The amount has gone up. And it has now, the, starting here, it's monthly. So this goes all the way out to fiscal year 2020. Now we're in fiscal year 2021. We are probably going to have about 100 non-pathogen reduced a month. 
and about eight to 900 uh, pathogen reduced, non-pathogen reduced about 100 to 150 or so, 900 or so um, pathogen reduced. And that's the kind of the way it's been for a, a long, long time. So we have a lot of data on a lot of patients. This is what the amatocillin looks like. This is the regular sorolin. This is the 8-MOP that's used for T-cell lymphomas uh, and um, psoriasis. Uh, this is the sorolin content of food, not exactly the same sorolin, but in celery and celeriac, which is celery root, milligram quantities. And we're talking picograms. So you have milligram and then you go to nanograms and micrograms and picograms. So it's quite um, a low um, amount that's infused as far as the toxicology is concerned. Uh, the FDA, therefore, had no problem um, in allowing the sorolin-treated platelets to be used for every patient in the hospital, including neonates and preemies, including those receiving phototherapy, which for reasons we don't have time to discuss, pregnancy, nursing mothers. It's been used at Yale since 2017. We have a three-and-a-half-year experience. We've transfused tens of thousands of, uh, of um, hundreds of thousands of patients, of, 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 of units, uh, and we haven't had uh, knock on press board uh, any problems. Uh, it's used for everyone. Jehovah's Witnesses, obviously, because of their religious beliefs, uh, it, it's not acceptable to them generally. But when we brought it in, we went to all, all the C-suite folk and the department chairs and got their approval. Also, the business office, because it is more expensive. We went to all the clinical groups and, and um, trained them on the new product because the bags look different, the plasma looked a different color. We got all the service lines involved. So it was, it was a, a very large effort, which we described in a manuscript that we wrote. This is what we're trying to prevent. This is uh, what we call uh, classical EDS, stands for egg drop soup, uh, if you will, because that's what it looks like. It's a bacteria growing, in this case, Staph aureus, in a unit of platelets. And the pH drops, the acid causes the platelets to clump, and you get this, which is obvious. What we're worried about are those that are contaminated and look normal. That's the problem, and that's why we've had six near misses recently, and we've had two deaths at this institution from contaminated platelets, actually one platelet and one red cell over the years, and we've had a lot of near misses. Fortunately, our blood bank staff can pick up something if it looks strange, if there's a lack of, of a platelet swirl, which is something we, we could talk about another time. Probably never we'll talk about it, but I just say that. Uh, but this is what we're trying to prevent. Um, data from Europe, because uh, you say, well, three years of data, why did you go on that? They've been using it in Europe for the past 15 years or 20 years, um, 2006 and earlier. They've used a total of 3.3 million trans units of platelets transfused in, in these three countries um, between 2006 and 2017. There were 76 contaminated products and 12 deaths. There were 705,000 intercept platelets transfused during that time. Admittedly, it's a fourth of it, but there were no deaths and no infections at all. And now that we have more data, Europe doesn't give the data out as, as frequently as we would like to see it, but there's been no reports that I know of any problems, with the exception of one or two cases of Acinetobacter, which is a separate, a separate issue, which uh, we don't have time to talk about today. We published our results in the British Journal of Hematology, uh, our Yale results with uh, Wade Schultz and, uh, and others. And these were, we had five uh, uh, near misses at Yale. There were septic reactions with conventional products, about 9,000. Uh, and there were about 12,000 pathogen reduced products had none. This was statistically significant. There were no other differences in any of the other types of reactions, uh, basically. Um, and we did data, we did studies, which we don't have much time to talk about, looking at the, the number of subsequent platelet transfusions. If the platelets were damaged by the material and didn't work, did they need to give another platelet very quickly? And with PR, there was a slight amount of damage. We will, uh, less than a uh, half of a quarter of a unit more was needed, half a unit here, 24 hours later, uh, maybe 0.6 of a unit. Here was 1.2 of a unit versus one. Uh, blue is the conventional non-pathogen reduced. This is the pathogen reduced. And none of these were irradiated, obviously. Well, obvious to me anyway. Uh, and as you got out 96 hours, there was, uh, you know, a little more. Uh, so the PR does a little damage, but the, the trade-off is you've got a product that is not pathogen, uh, is not potentially pathogen contaminated. And this was the time between the next platelet transfusion. Again, if it didn't work, they would give platelets sooner, and there was no significant difference between the two. Um, 
And uh, as far as red cell utilization, actually 24, 48, up to 96 hours later, subsequent red cell transfusion, if the platelets didn't work, they would probably transfuse more red cells because the patient would still be bleeding. And there was a little more, less again, point units, 0.2 more of a unit in the conventional group than all the way out than it was in the pathogen reduction group, showing that the platelets worked. There may have been a little more platelets used, a poor part of a unit, but nothing substantial. It was my impression and that of most of the reviewers is that it was worth the uh, the trade-off. We also looked at our data for, for uh, pediatric patients as well, because there's very little, and we showed almost exactly the same results as far as the uh, efficacy and the utilization, and there was really no difference between the conventional for neonates, infants, or pediatric up to 18 years for both conventional versus pathogen-reduced and pediatric uh, groups as well. So what we have is a product that appears to be uh, beneficial that it prevents the, uh, the loss, of it, it, it removes pathogens, but it also allows uh, platelets to function properly and be hemostatically effective. We finished a phase four trial called Piper with 3,000 patients comparing uh, patients getting conventional versus intercept treated in the HEMOC group. And uh, we, trans we uh, contributed about 50, about 530 patients of the 3,000. They wouldn't let us do more because they didn't want to overweight the study. This is being analyzed and will hopefully be uh, in a New England Journal article near you at some time in the future or another journal perhaps. But it's the largest study looking at a uh, group of patients uh, getting uh, conventional versus pathogen-reduced platelets. Uh, the, the second part, just to close up, um, is with the red cell pathogens. Again, you want to have a pathogen material um, uh, reduced by for red cells as well. This study is in phase three clinical trials, which we're doing now at Yale. We have two groups of patients we're studying. Again, the benefit, if you don't have a red cell product, you're not going to be able to get rid of the gamma irradiators, but you need to provide the uh, radiation. Uh, also, uh, it will eliminate not only the viruses and bacteria, but also Babesia, and also will eliminate uh, the need to irradiate the, the, the white cells for the same reason. This technology, the S303, intercalates into the DNA or RNA that crosslinks by a chemical reaction. It doesn't require light. Uh, it occurs faster than the linker degrades, allowing uh, a blockage of uh, a replication. So it does inactivate the pathogens. And then it degrades to a non-toxic uh, non, uh, product. It is a quinacrine, which is, a, 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 those of you who know, there are some concerns, but it, it, it it inactivates quite rapidly uh, and is uh, washed and it's essentially removed. And the data, which I don't have time to share, unfortunately, shows that there is not a risk of toxicology associated with this. This is used routinely in Europe um, and uh, is now being uh, in phase three clinical trials here at Yale. Um, it's again for up to 42 days of storage. We're studying two groups of patients, the, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, the log reduction is similar to what the Sorolin is, uh, five log reductions, and 99.9 uh, .9 is three log reductions. So these are five, six logs uh, with various uh, viruses uh, and uh, the bacteria. The studies we're doing, uh, the acute study in uh, cardiac surgery, and we're doing one in chronically anemic patients getting simple transfusions called Redis, which is what we're going to be doing on the seventh floor and in the outpatient clinics where we patients who need a blood transfusion will get randomized after they sign a written informed consent, obviously went through the uh, um, IRB, to whether they get the pathogen reduced or conventional red cells. And they're not transfused for the study. If their doctor says they need a transfusion and they've agreed, uh, we will give them one or the other, but we are not going to irradiate the pathogen reduced product because uh, that would cause a double damage to the platelet. Uh, or, the, or the red cell rather. So uh, the purpose of this talk was also to reassure everyone that the data show clearly that pathogen reduction prevents graft versus host. So for those of your chemotherapy patients that may need it, pathogen reduction would be acceptable. And here's the, the major data showing the number of adduct formation with gamma radiation, one in every 37,000 base pairs uh, forms an adduct, which is enough to block graft versus host because that's the standard. With S59 uh, plus UVA, it's one in every 83 base pair shown in, a, in, this, in this cartoon. Uh, the data is in blood 1998. And for S303, the data hasn't been published yet, 
but you get an even more robust adduct formation with whole blood or with red cells. It's an average of one in every 38 to one in every 53, or does magnitude more than the adduct formation with gamma radiation. So there's no reason to believe that uh, using pathogen reduced product in, in lieu of a, a gamma radiated product will be as safe. We're not showing it's obviously better, but as safe. Um, and then other studies coming out of Europe show no reported TAGVHD with irradiated products, conventional uh, amatocillin, 186,000, again, no reported cases. Again, orders of magnitude less, but and in Switzerland, similarly, uh, no reports uh, with the, um, with, uh, the, the uh, uh, with the use of the uh, sorolin. Um, TAGVHD in summary is rare but fatal. Treatment is unsuccessful. Prevention is best and essentially the only approach. Death due to marrow aplasia, gamma radiation or pathogen reduction are both acceptable to the FDA, to the IRB. Uh, in Europe, the data are there. PR platelets use amatocillin and UVA. Red cells use amustelin. Nucleic acid attic formation is more robust. And there's no need to do both, as this will produce unwanted cellular damage. And there are a couple of references here, and I will end there and thank you for your attention. Well, Ed, uh, thank you. It's a terrific work and really an advance in transfusion medicine that obviously addresses multiple complications. Just because we're running a little late, I think we'll probably not, we'll, we'll ask people to send you questions directly and turn to our next speaker. Um, so our next uh, lecturer is uh, Dr. Sukitra Krishnansaran. And, and Sukitra is, as you know, is a professor of psychiatry and the chair of the Human Investigations Committee at Yale. And her work over the years has really been as a leader in understanding tobacco treatment control um, and the interventions and risk factors associated with it. Her work was instrumental in the Surgeon General's report of preventing tobacco use among young people. She served on the FDA's uh, Tobacco Product Scientific Advisory Committee and currently serves, serves on the CDC's Interagency Commission on Smoking and Health. And her work on e-cigarettes really has been critical, particularly as these have become far more trendy, sadly, particularly among young people. So Sakitra, thank you for sharing your work with us. You're on, I think your video and, and uh, sound and uh, audio is off. Let me fix this. Sorry about that. It's okay. Let's start again. Can you see the screen? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Wonderful. Again, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, to this group today. So I'm going to give you a, tell you about something which is completely different than what you've heard about from Ed. And uh, um, uh, this relates to this public health problem of e-cigarettes. And I, um, I'm going to kind of give you an overview because I has figured that many of you may not have really heard about this debate or um, about these products and what the concern is relating to these. So I'm just going to give you a little basic overview and give you an update of where we are as a field um, in this area. Uh, okay, there we go. Um, so I have no um, conflicts or disclosures to report. Um, as uh, was mentioned, I have served as a member of FDA's Tobacco Product Scientific, Scientific Advisory Committee, which is a committee which reviews tobacco products and um, um, approves them for uh, marketing and presentation in the US market. And I'm also a current member of CDC's ICSH. And I also co-lead the Tobacco Center of Regulatory Science at Yale. Um, so just a brief presentation of what the problem is. So this is something I'm gonna be coming back to uh, later in my talk too. Um, with e-cigarettes, there are two uh, uh, parts to the public health uh, problem and question that is being debated a lot uh, today. One is potentially they pose benefits. Uh, they could help reduce disease risk for current smokers. If they switch to using these products, they could reduce disease morbidity for smokers. And I'm sure this is a huge concern for this community because of the known relationship between tobacco use, uh, smoking and um, cancer risk. So um, this is very, very beneficial if it, uh, if it works out uh, that way. 
Um, on the other hand, you have the harms, which is in the right-hand side panel. Um, unfortunately, as we have seen in the US, um, increased rates of use of these products amongst youth. So there's an increased risk of exposure to nicotine, nicotine addiction, um, future disease risks, and a whole renormalization re of tobacco use behaviors. And even amongst adults who switch to using this product, there is a great deal of concern of dual use behavior. So what a lot of adults are doing is not necessarily switching completely to use of these products, but are choosing to use both cigarettes and e-cigarettes, um, uh, depending you know, on convenience and where they can use these products. And that is not good either. And of course, then there's a secondhand aerosol exposure issue, which again, we know very little about. So these products are so new on the market. So just to take a step back, as I said, this is the top public health concern, which is cigarette smoking or tobacco smoking or cigar use, all these combustible products that create havoc on multiple organ systems and also have um, contribute to cancer risk. So over the years in the US, we've done multiple, we put into place multiple public health um, policies to try and address um, cigarette use behaviors, as many of you know. And um, uh, most recently, the one that has uh, been quite influential is this FDA, allowing FDA to regulate these tobacco products. If uh, um, uh, for those who know this area, um, you know, the FDA had been trying for a long time to, uh, to um, get uh, this role, to have the ability to regulate these products. And that only went into place when this um, Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was signed in 2009 by uh, President Obama. So since then, the FDA has been um, trying to put into place uh, regulations on the manufacture, distribution, and marketing um, of these products to protect public health. And that's where e-cigarettes kind of come into the picture. They were actually invented by a Chinese pharmacist who wanted to develop a cleaner form of nicotine um, to help uh, smokers quit smoking. Um, it uh, was created in 2003, started appearing in the US in about 2009, and today, today there are over 400 e-cigarette brands. A basic e-cigarette is a very simple, really simple, um, um, I should say, I don't know if you even call it an equipment or a device. Um, uh, there is a, um, there's a power component here which charges the e-cigarettes. Not all of them look like this, obviously. I'll show you some pictures. Um, there is a control element where the user can push a button uh, to activate it and um, heat uh, the juice, which is located in this uh, compartment here. And at the other end, there is a, um, there's a mouthpiece that the user can then use to um, uh, get, take in the vapors that are created. Um, they started address, uh, uh, entering the US market in about 2009. And when they first entered, the FDA really tried to prevent them from entering the market by directing the border, uh, border um, protection agencies to reject the entry of these products into the market because they were unapproved drug delivery devices. They wanted to classify them as a drug delivery device. But there was a lawsuit that was brought against the FDA by a uh, e-cigarette company at that time. And they said that the FDA had no authority over e-cigarettes because they were a tobacco product and that they were not a drug delivery device or a drug uh, device combination uh, because they were not being sold for any therapeutic purpose in the US. Uh, one would think that that would have been turned down, but they actually were successful in the US district court um, uh, and uh, the US District Court basically prohibited the FDA from seizing the e-cigarettes as devices or drug devices. So they also ruled that the FDA could only regulate these e-cigarettes as a tobacco product unless therapeutic claims are made. So any products you see on the market can only be regulated as tobacco products. They're not regulated yet, but they can only be regulated and they cannot make any therapeutic claims. So the FDA has actually come up with a whole series of um, a whole another uh, way that these products can be uh, regulated and they give them marketing claims and they can make certain claims about what the product can be used for, but they, it cannot be a direct therapeutic claim because they are not, uh, none of these companies are actually proceeding along the therapeutic um, side of FDA to get them approved as a cessation device. They are just um, getting them regulated uh, or approved as a tobacco product. So essentially what I said here is that, you know, they can only be regulated as a tobacco product. Um, they, uh, the FSPTCA did not cover them till almost 2016 because the original 
a law that uh, President Obama signed did not cover e-cigarettes. So they actually incorporated it into the law only in 2016. So therefore from 2010 to 2016, these products have been unregulated and they will probably remain unregulated through 2022 because as I said, the FD has a different way of regulating them and all these companies are now submitting their safety data to the FDA through this pre-market tobacco product application, which were all due September 9th, 2020. So the FDA is just reviewing products from thousands and thousands of companies or products, as I understand, to really see if they should be uh, allowed to have any marketing claims. In the meantime, there has just been an evolution of, uh, or an explosion, I should say, in the market in terms of the products available. You get products which look like cigarettes on the left-hand side going all the way to these pens, which you can uh, replace uh, e-liquids in. You have these box mods, which look nothing like a cigarette, which, which allow you to uh, change, um, uh, you know, produce huge vapor clouds and all these other kinds of behaviors. And then you have the most recent entrance, which was the Jewel, which is that little black device you see um, a third from uh, the right-hand side and some other devices, which are called pod devices, which essentially the way all these differ is in terms of whether it is a closed system in the sense that the nicotine is contained in it and you, and you vape it, whether you can fill in new e-liquids like the vape pens allow you to do, or these pod devices, which are completely closed systems um, that come with these pods that are pre-filled and you just slide them in. Now, this has also led to a huge black market. So even with the pod devices now, you can buy um, unfilled pods that you can then fill with whatever you want. And this has um, led to a huge increase in rates of marijuana use and use of a variety of other products because people are filling pods with all kinds of different things and vaping them. So this is basically just to give you an idea of what exists. And this shows you the sales that has um, in Nielsen tracked retail channels by brand. And you can see the amount of sales that go towards uh, e-cigarettes. And it's obviously a very, very profitable market, which is why a lot of people are investing in these products. So I bring you back now to what I started the talk with, which is let's now talk about the benefits and the harms. So let's proceed to talking about harms or toxicity first. I'm just gonna show you snippets of data. There's a huge literature out there, but in the interest of time, let's ask the first question. When you look at e-cigarettes and you compare them to e-cigarettes uh, or combustible products, do they actually have reduced harm? So if you do an apples to apples comparison and you look at things like, um, so, like some of the nitrosamines, the NNN, NNKs, and some of these pro, uh, compounds, tobacco-specific nitrosamines that have been shown to be toxic and have significant cancer risk. When you look at the con content of these nitrosamines in combustible products versus e-cigarettes, you definitely see that e-cigarette exposure results in less exposure to tobacco-specific nitrosamines. It does not completely eliminate them, but there's definitely less, less exposure. Um, but our concerns about this are not just the nitrosamines. There are a variety of other products that are, exist in e-cigarettes, which, which combined with the way these products are being used, which is almost in many people, almost constantly used throughout the day, raises a lot of concerns about what some of these um, co uh, contents could do. So an example of some of these are um, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerine. Um, which are used, included as um, solvents or constituents. Uh, there are a lot of flavor chemicals, which are all aldehydes, and I'll talk about them in a second. There are sweeteners that are present in um, uh, these products and other solvents, including alcohol. Um, and of course, nicotine and a variety of metals. And metals actually come from the coil. When the coil is heated, it releases metals. And so this is all part of what the individual is going to be um, inhaling when they uh, inhale um, this particular product. And the figure shows you um, some of the other ultrafine particles and so on, which could be uh, produced. Um, so I'll just briefly touch on flavors because that is a huge um, um, uh, focus of our tobacco center here at Yale. We are really interested in understanding the role of flavors in appeal addiction and toxicity of these products. And I'm gonna address toxicity here. So the flavors, as you know, it are made up of flavor chemicals. So they are not just benign um, uh, you know, flavor molecules. 
some of these chemicals are identified and are listed out here, you'll see many of them are aldehydes and um, depending on the concentration can have significant health effects, uh, not health effects, I'm sorry, let me back up, significant toxicity. Um, there was an argument made initially that these are flavor chemicals and they are grass or generally recognized as safe but they are not generally recognized as safe for inhalational use. They are grass for edible use, not for inhal inhalation use. And it's a very important distinction. And what we are finding through uh, a lot of the uh, cellular toxicity work going on is that many of these flavor molecules are, um, have, are toxic to cells. Some of them also have been known to have diseased uh, risk. So an example of this is diacetyl, which is um, a, a chemical which is inc included to produce butter flavor. And it has been known to be associated with popcorn lung disease, which was actually found in people who were working in popcorn factories. So this chemical is still used in many um, of these e-liquids as a flavoring chemical. So there are um, concerns about toxicity of these flavors. And our tobacco center has also shown that these flavor aldehydes actually form what are called acetyl adducts with the propylene glycol and the glycerine in um, uh, this, uh, the e-liquid. And that these acetyl adducts that are formed when the solute are, they are just formed when the e-liquid is just sitting on the shelf. And these acetyl, acetyl adducts we are showing are actually stronger airway irritants than the um, original aldehydes itself. So like vanillin, um, uh, adduct will actually be is a stronger air, airway irritant than vanillin itself. So this is an area which we need to uh, need a lot more research on. And there's similar kind of work on all the other um, products that I listed earlier from e-cigarettes from many other people in the country. And uh, there was a National Academy of Science report which came out in 2018 on the public health consequences of e-cigarettes which basically I'm presenting you with an overview of findings, but you should feel free to check it out. Um, they, they concluded that e-cigarettes were not risk-free, while the current evidence suggests that they are far less harmful than combustible tobacco cigarettes, and a smoker is uh, uh, exposed to lower levels of toxic substances other than nicotine, there may be some short-term, um, uh, resulting in reduced short-term adverse health outcomes, that there was very little data to assess the impact on cancer and health, uh, heart disease risk. And there's a lot more um, evidence coming out on heart disease risk at this point, but not yet that much on cancer risk. Um, I also thought you would be interested in seeing the specific cancer related section that they um, had in uh, this public, in this report. Um, essentially, uh, what this says is there is no available evidence that uh, e-cigarette use is associated with intermediate um, cancer endpoints, but that there is substantial evidence that some chemicals present, uh, present in e-cigarette aerosol, like formaldehyde and acrolein, are capable of causing DNA damage and mutagenesis. But this has not panned out into a clinical outcome per se, and um, you know, there's more to come and much more work that needs to be done on this issue. So let's move on to why we are concerned about this in the US and we are really concerned about it. Uh, we really started becoming very concerned about it because of the extensive use among youth. This, show, this shows you uh, the current tobacco product use amongst high school students in the US from the National Youth Tobacco Data. And you see here, this, this red line is indicative of e-cigarettes. Now, um, they're, they're, uh, the rates were significantly increasing through 2019 and in 2018 and 2019, we discovered a lot of these increase in rates was because of the presence of Juul in the market. And um, there were certain regulations put on Juul uh, um, in 2019. Um, you do see a decrease in 2020, but I will tell you that we don't really know if this decrease is because of the regulations that were put into place or whether it was COVID related from two perspectives. First, this NYTS data, um, the collection of this data, which goes on pretty much through six months of the year, had to be stopped because of COVID, so only, they only got a partial sample. And secondly, we are also seeing in Connecticut that rates in, um, uh, amongst youth have gone down because of lack of access and lack of the same kind of cues that they experience in schools from seeing their peers use and so on and so forth. So. Um, we don't know what this is related to, whether it's regulatory or related to COVID, but the rates have gone down um, at least in, the, in early 2020 to what it was in um, 2018. That's still not low, but it's still um, 
uh, you know, did head in the right direction. Youth are using multiple kinds of devices. So this is the other concern, BC youth using um, every device that's available on the market. There is a lot of concern about nicotine use in these devices because uh, devices like the Juul contain very high levels of nicotine. And the adolescent brain is more sensitive to nicotine than the adult brain. And it's really tobacco nicotine exposure primes the adolescent brain for nicotine addiction, addiction to other substances. It alters developmental maturing. And it can also have effects on multiple organs. I'm sure you, uh, you are all well aware of the, of the acetylcholine uh, or the cholinergic system and know that nicotine um, binds to the cholinergic receptors and can therefore influence a variety of other organ systems shown here. Youth also use multiple flavors and I've already talked to you a little bit about the toxicity of flavors. Flavors are what draw youth to use of these products. So this is a great deal of concern about this. Youth use e-cigarettes for many alternative purposes. You know, um, uh, they use them for vape tricks, which is the huge cloud competitions and vape clouds that you may have seen. Um, they participate in cloud competitions. These are some of the clouds that you, uh, shapes that you can create using these products. They use it for something called dripping, which means opening up uh, the device and putting the e-liquid directly onto uh, the ba open battery and inhaling it. They use it for vaping cannabis. So. Um, this has in fact gone up significantly. As I said, a lot of these products can be manipulated. So youth are actually adding in other things into these devices. So if you see somebody vaping, there's no guarantee they're just vaping nicotine. They could be using something else in the product and most likely that it's probably a cannabis related product. And as I said, the, uh, there is multiple papers on this, but this is one of our papers which shows that e-cigarette use amongst youth leads to cigarette use. So. Um, Let's now move on to talking about smoking cessation. So we've talked about all the bad things. Now let's see, well, is it actually doing what it was, what it set out to do, which is help smokers quit smoking? The evidence on that is still emerging. Unfortunately, we don't have clear cut uh, um, uh, answers yet because doing an RCT on this issue in the US is very, very difficult because of the way the products are regulated. Once the FDA, maybe once the FDA gets more information on the toxicity and safety of some of these products, they would be willing to allow an RCT to proceed more easily for cessation purposes. But at this point, um, that is very hard to do. There have been a few, few well done R RCTs, and, but the overall um, idea is uh, based, of, based on some Cochrane reviews is there are small sample sizes, um, um, and, but they do seem to show some efficacy. Um, but there are multiple observational studies. So if you go out and talk to smokers, there are many smokers who will tell you that these products have helped them reduce use of cigarettes, if not completely quit, which of course then leads to the concern I had raised earlier about use of both products at the same time. This is a result of an RCT which came out in uh, New England Journal of Medicine from the UK, um, which shows you that uh, use of e-cigarettes versus nicotine replacement, the outcomes at, at the end of 52 weeks um, um, or after um, um, the initial start of the trial, uh, the outcome is better for e-cigarettes than it is for nicotine replacement. And um, also that those who use e-cigarettes seem to uh, have some benefits in terms of uh, some of the respiratory outcomes that are associated with cigarette use. This is another trial that just came out from uh, New Zealand, where they showed again that use e-cigarettes do have some, albeit very small, uh, benefit over and above um, using patches alone in terms of uh, produce having an efficacy or helping smokers quit smoking. So the jury is still out on this issue also. And uh, as the National Academy of Sciences report basically said, um, they're, uh, the, they, are, they are very concerned about the use of the public, when you consider the public health consequences of e-cigarettes, we have this huge uh, divide of, uh, of, of a product that is really having an impact on youth. Um, there is limited evidence that the product may help uh, um, uh, people stop smoking cigarettes completely. Um, there seems to be more evidence of dual use behavior. So we really need more work to help people convert to e-cigarettes. And um, they also said that if people are able to completely switch from cigarettes to e-cigarettes, it will reduce exposure to numerous toxicants and carcinogens. Now, one might ask, well, is there some way of regulating these products to prevent use, youth use but support smoking cessation? And this is a debate that the field has been having for a very long time. 
And I will basically tell you that we haven't reached any big conclusions at this point. Um, I've listed some uh, ways we could go. We could regulate the nicotine levels. Um, uh, the EU, for example, only allows a nicotine level up to 20 milligrams per mil in the e-liquid. Um, uh, uh, to give you an example, Juul contains up to 60 milligrams per mil. Um, the, the concern here is that smokers may actually need higher levels of nicotine to quit smoking and get satisfaction from that product. So this issue has really not been resolved and um, there doesn't seem to be that much movement in terms of regulating nicotine levels. Uh, we could regulate flavors. An example is Canada. They've removed all flavors in e-liquids, but then there's a concern that smokers may actually need the flavors to quit smoking. We know this is something that will definitely be beneficial for youth because youth are really drawn to the flavors in the product. We could regulate the kind of devices available. You know, I talked about these open and closed system products. Open system products, you can add things in, it can uh, lead to a variety of other behaviors. Um, but, um, um, you know, there's a concern about that also, and you could just allow closed system devices, but closed system devices were the ones which were very popular amongst youth. So we really not reached any consensus about this issue. Um, so I just wanted to end with this about what you can do um, as clinicians, people working in this area. I would say continue to encourage your patients to quit smoking. I don't think there is, a, I think to, a combustible cigarette use is about the worst behavior, especially from a cancer risk. So that does need to continue. Um, use treatments that have been shown to work and that are approved like the existing behavioral interventions and gum and Chantix. And these are uh, proven interventions have been shown to work. If nothing else works and your patients want to use these cigarettes, then I think you could support them but you need to warn them about not overusing e-cigarettes and getting in more nicotine than what they normally will do. They also need to have a plan for quitting cigarettes completely, no dual use behaviors. You know, they shouldn't just use e the product whenever uh, convenient. And they should have a plan to quit e-cigarettes as well. We don't want to have a generation just dependent on nicotine either because we don't know what the long-term consequences of this are. Um, you can also educate your parents and help educate communities and local schools uh, to really advise them of what, what these products could do. And finally, I would say really help us collect scientific evidence on e-cigarettes. I know that um, e-cigarettes was on the grand challenge during the retreat, um, and I hope that this push will continue and that you all will be involved in helping us collect more toxicity, safety, and efficacy data on um, these products so we can um, regulate them and appropriately. The point is they're out in the market. Everybody is using them and we are trying to develop all the science. It's almost like backtracking on the development of science and that is where many of these concerns have risen. So I will stop there considering the time um, and uh, happy to answer any questions. Well, Sir Kicha, thank you. Um, I know we're a little late. I just, actually, uh, Melinda Irwin sent more a comment than a question, but I think it's, it's important. She writes, important talk and area of focus, given f the 50% uh, of reduction in cancer mortality from the peak uh, due to tobacco control. And obviously, I guess, uh, given your point, this sort of resurgence of exposure through e-cigarettes, do you perceive that that actually could uh, reverse the trend, as it were? Um, I'm hoping not, um, uh, you know, but we do. I think the question is, can we get all these youth who are the new entrants into this area to stop? And that's what a lot of prevention work and also our work at Yale, we are doing a lot of cessation related programs. So we are doing a lot of education prevention and cessation in high schools. Um, so if you are, any of you are aware of the need, please send me a note and we can certainly go out and talk to the group. If we can prevent these entrants, I think we would, be, uh, we would really serve public health very well because we, one thing we don't want them to do, we don't want them to then convert to using the products. These are all, all these kids are gonna be nicotine addicted. If e-cigarettes don't serve them well, they're gonna to want to move on to products which serve them better, which are cigarettes. Um, you know, cigarette is one of the best nicotine delivery devices I have ever seen. So um, that's the biggest concern, which is, will there be a re-emergence of combustible tobacco and nicotine use? And will that then lead to um, the problems we've seen earlier? So I can't answer that question, Melinda. It's a very good one though. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Um, it was an excellent talk. Um, you know, it, it's 103, so I think we'll we'll break. But I wanted to say, thank uh, Sakitra and Ed for two superb talks. Thank you all for attending, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.